Welcome back. We are on Unit 3 Curve Sketching Lesson 4. Today we will be talking about rational functions. In this lesson, we will be examining the features of derivatives as they relate to rational functions and practical situations. Simple rational functions have a specific characteristic to them that are called vertical asymptotes. So let's first take a look at these simple rational functions. So the first one, f at x, is equal to 1 over x minus 2. Remember, for a rational function, we can't have a 0 in the denominator. It is undefined. Uh, so when we are looking for the vertical asymptote, we can just take the denominator, in this case, x minus 2, and set it equal to 0, and then solve for the value of x. So in this case, x is equal to 2 is the vertical asymptote of this first function. So in function number 2, we have f at x is equal to 2 over x minus 5 times x plus 3. So in the case of our second function, our vertical asymptotes are then x is equal to 5 and x is equal to negative 3. And these are the equation of the vertical asymptotes. Recall that an asymptote is not part of the function, but rather a boundary that shows where the function is not defined. So let's take a look at this example of a rational function. So we have a vertical asymptote at positive 2. And if we were to approach the asymptote from the left side, the function approaches negative infinity. Looking now at the function, as we approach the asymptote towards the right side, the function approaches positive infinity. And so these are characteristics of rational functions. So understanding this and understanding calculus and all our curve sketching tools, we're going to look at how we can use all of this in order to sketch a rational function. Let's take a look at example number one. Consider the function f at x is equal to 1 over x plus 2 times x minus 3. A, determine the vertical asymptotes. B, find the one-sided limit as the x approaches the vertical asymptotes and then sketch the function. Okay, so let's take a look. So example number one, first off, let's determine the, the vertical asymptotes. Remember that um, in this case, when we have two brackets, we want to consider both cases. Uh, we look at each separately, and, and our asymptotes here is negative 2, and x is equal to 3. Okay. So b part, if we want to just, let's just uh, look at it just right here, so b. Okay, if we said that the limit, we'll just take 3 first, as x approaches 3 from the negative direction, f at x, okay, is equal to the limit. As x approaches 3 from the negative direction, okay, so 1 over x plus 2, x minus 3. Okay, so that's just our function again. What's going to happen is that this bracket will turn into 5, okay, and then this bracket will actually get very, very small, okay, so it will become very, very negative. So in this case, um, we are going to have a large number down here, but it would be very negative, so we're going to actually be approaching negative infinity. I'm just going to take a little shortcut um, by just doing a little short form here. So 3 from the positive direction. Okay, so we can do the same thing again. So x plus 2, x uh, minus 3. Okay, so if we look at it just analytically, again, what we would find is that this bracket, well, this bracket will go to 5. This bracket will get very, very large, but in a positive direction. So we will be approaching positive infinity. Okay, some, uh, so positive infinity from the right side and negative infinity from the, the negative left side. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing with negative 2. So if we now looked at uh, negative 2, 
limit. As x approaches negative 2, what we would find, we can use the same technique again. Coming from the negative direction, we're going to find that it's actually going to approach infinity and the limit as x approaches negative infinity from the positive direction will be negative infinity. Okay? So how can we use this now in order to sketch our graph? What I'm going to first do is draw dotted lines where my asymptotes are. So negative 2 and positive 3. Okay. So I'm just going to do a quick sketch. Now I could find my y-intercept if I really wanted to use those steps. I could do that if I'd like to. Um, I'm just going to sketch it just like this, like that. And from the negative direction, it's going to go to positive. And here, it will just simply look like this. Okay, so there's our nice quick sketch. So looking at example number two. Uh, we're going to actually use derivatives this time in order to sketch our rational function. Uh, we're given the function f of x is equal to 1 over x squared plus 1. So A, we want to find the increasing and decreasing intervals of the function. B, find any points of inflection. And C, does the graph ever cross the x-axis? D, sketch the function. Okay, so let's take a look at this question. Okay, so first things first. We should find the derivative because it is asking us in part A to find increasing and decreasing intervals, and we know that increasing and decreasing means that we have to inspect the first derivative. So let's use this little space up here. We have f primed at x. Okay, so I would what I would do, I know you want to use the quotient rule and use your little quotient rule song, um, but first I think that we should just change this over to something that looks nice, and you'll see how it looks um, it's a bit easier to just use the chain rule rather than to use the quotient rule. So if I made it look like that, I can now use the chain rule in order to find the first derivative. So up here, prime at x is then equal to, okay, using the chain rule, negative 1, x squared plus 1, negative 2, and then the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. So then our first derivative then is 2x, negative 2x, all over x squared plus 1, all squared. Okay. Remember, for intervals of increase and decrease, you need to find your critical number. Okay, and that's going to help you to come up with your intervals, to set up your table, um, to find where it is increasing and decreasing. So Looking at this, remember our critical point, okay, that criteria right there. Okay, so at looking at this, we're going to say that 0 um, is then equal to, so what's going to happen is I'm going to set this entire thing equal to 0. When I multiply the numerator or the denominator with 0, I'm simply left with negative 2x. Okay, how do I satisfy this condition? For this equation, x has to equal 0. Okay, so that's my critical number. And I'm going to use that number now in order to come up with a table. Okay, so I've kind of sketched one out here for you. I know it's not as nice as my other ones, but um, it'll have to do for now. So x is equal to 0. So we're going to check values on either sides of the critical number. Okay, and then this will be value. Uh, this will be f primed at x. It's just the sign of f primed at x and f at x. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to pick values that are easy to, to work with. My second favorite number is 1, so I'm going to use that. So this should be negative 1. Okay. So I'm just going to rewrite that negative 1. Okay. So we know, okay, so we know our true value here is 0. Our first derivative then is 0. So we've got a plateau or either a local max or min. Okay. Now subbing back into our first derivative, which I'm going to rewrite just here so you can see it. Negative 2x all over x squared plus 1 squared. 
Okay, so we take negative 1 and we sub it into here. So it's going to be positive in the numerator or the denominator because of the square. Uh, this negative number will be multiplied to negative 2, which will give us a positive value. Okay, uh, if we take positive 1 and we multiply it to negative 2, that'll be negative. So increase, decrease. So just to complete the question, we just want to write a little statement that clearly shows us that we understand the, the solution. Okay, so f at x is then increasing for when x is smaller than 0. Okay, looking at our graph. f at x is decreasing for x is greater than 0. Okay, so now we want to find the points of inflection. In order for us to do so, we need to find the second derivative. Okay, so I'm just going to steal this little space right here at the bottom. So finding our second derivative, so over here I've rewritten the first derivatives, uh, derivative so that we can have a little bit more space to work with. Uh, so let's use the quotient rule. Okay, so I'm going to say g at x is the, the numerator, okay, and we'll say this is h at x. Okay, so g at x, uh, we'll say is negative 2x, so g primed at x is equal to negative 2. h at x is equal to x squared plus 1 squared, okay? Uh, and what we're going to do now is use the chain rule to find its derivative, which is then equal to 2 x squared plus 1 times 2x, okay? So simplifying that will be 4x x squared plus 1. So using the quotient rule, f double primed at x then is equal to okay, so what we have is low which is x squared plus 1 squared d high negative 2 less high Use your brackets because you don't want to make mistakes when it comes to negatives because it is a long process. D low. So 4x, x squared plus 1 all over x squared plus 1. And since it was a squared, we're going to square that again, is 4. Okay? Okay, so let's see if we can, we can actually cancel out probably one of these terms. All right, so x squared plus 1, so we can actually cancel one of them out. So let's factor that out first. So x squared plus 1, okay, we're going to factor one of those out. So that leaves us with one of these here and negative 2. Don't worry, I will multiply all of that in. Minus, I'm going to group this, if it's not too confusing here. Negative 8x squared. Okay, and then uh, that is gone because we factored one of them out. Okay, x squared plus 1 to the exponent of 4. So what we're going to do now is we're going to cancel out that with one of those. At least it's with 3 in the denominator. And now let's work this out. So can we, can we cancel or pull out a negative 2? I think that's what I'm going to try and do first and see if there's anything that we can do to kind of simplify because we want to actually use the second derivative. And that works to be 4x squared. And we have x squared plus 1 to the exponent 3. Okay. So what do we have now? So we've canceled one of those, and we can group these. So negative 2. I'm changing my brackets, yes. Uh, 5x squared plus 1 all over x squared plus 1 to the exponent 3. Okay, let's double check our answer here. Okay, it looks like I have noticed an error. So up here, 
When I factored out a negative 2, that would change this sign to a positive. So multiplying positive 8 or positive 4 with a negative, it'll be a negative 4. Okay, so it's negative 4, which makes this negative 4 plus a positive 1. Uh, that would be a negative 3x squared. Okay, so let's multiply the negative 2 in. So what we have here would then be 6x squared minus 2 all over x squared plus 1 to the exponent 3. Okay, so that is our second derivative. Okay, so we want to find the, the inflection point. So we know the inflection point happens when our second derivative is equal to 0. So let's set this equal to 0. So 0, so what's going to happen is if we set this equal to 0, our denominator when we multiply by 0 will also be 0. So we're just left with the numerator. Okay, so there's our numerator. So isolating for x, 6x is equal to 2 squared x. Then is equal to 1 over 3, and that, that is the square root of 1 over 3. Plus or minus, of course. So we have inflection points when x is equal to positive, this is the root of 1 over 3 and when x is equal to the negative of 1 over 3. So back to our question, I just filled in the answer. Uh, part C, does the graph ever cross the x-axis? So crossing the x-axis means that the function will be negative. Okay, let's look at this analytically, okay? Looking at our original function, f at x is equal to 1 over x squared plus 1, okay? No matter what value we put into x, whether it be negative or positive, because of the square, it will always be positive, <clears throat> meaning that the entire function will always be positive. So no. No. I'm just going to put no. Uh, and now we'll just, we're going to sketch the graph. Okay, so we know that we have a critical number um, where x is equal to, to 0. Okay, so we're going to have a critical point when x is equal to 0. Well, we don't know. All we know is that the graph will not cross the x-axis, okay? Um, but we can also figure out whether it concaves up or concaves down, so whether that critical uh, point is a local max or a local min, okay, by taking that number and putting it into the, the second derivative. Okay, so that means that first term will go away and we just have 2. And same down here, this will, x squared will go away and we'll just have 1. So it is a negative number, so that means if it's negative, okay, it's concaving down and we have a local maximum. Okay. We can even now take x is equal to 0 and plug it back into our original function. Okay, so we'll just do that right here. f at x at 0 is then equal to 1 over 0 squared plus 1. Okay, so that means that the point, the critical point then is equal to 0 and 1. Okay, so 0 and 1. Okay, so I'm going to exaggerate this graph just so that we can see it a little better and we'll say that this point up here is 1. Okay, so that there's one there, and we're concaving down. So remember, we're never going to cross the x-axis, so it's going to look something like that. There we go. Okay, so we are now on our last question, example number three. We want to find the intervals of concavity for the function f at x is equal to negative 1 over x plus 2. So concavity, which means that we need to analyze the second derivative. Okay, let's first find the first derivative. So f prime at x then is equal to, okay, I'm just going to change this function to negative 1 x plus 2 to the negative 1. I just find it easier. Okay, so using chain rule, we have 1 times negative, negative 1 times negative 1, just positive 1, so it's x plus 2 to the negative 2. 
okay, which we can simply just leave that because we're going to take its derivative yet again. Okay, so I think it's easier to just leave it like this rather than to use the quotient rule. Uh, now taking the chain rule again, or using the chain rule again, so bringing down the negative 2, x plus 2 to the negative 3, and of course taking the derivative of the inside is just 1. Okay, so rewriting that is 2, x plus 2 to the exponent 3, and there is our second derivative. So we are asked to find the intervals of the concavity. So we want to find inflection points. Okay, and that'll help us to come up with the, um, the intervals. Okay, in order to come up with our table. So we want to set this equal to zero. And when we do so, what we're going to find is, okay, I'm just going to rewrite this we'll need to multiply the denominator by zero, and that'll just leave us with negative two, which is not exactly an answer. So there is no value in which the second derivative is equal to zero, so there's no inflection points, which means we can't use the second derivative. In this case, what we have to use is the asymptotes. So in this type of question, we want to use our asymptote or asymptotes. In this case, it is our asymptote. We're going to use the asymptote in order to uh, determine the intervals of concavity. So in this case, our asymptote then is just simply equal to x is equal to negative 2. So let's define our intervals. I'm just going to draw a table, and I understand that you probably already understand the behavior of irrational functions from maybe advanced functions, but um, we're going to use the derivative, actually, in fact, the second derivative in order to uh, answer this problem, okay? So our value, second derivative, and f at x. Okay, so I'm just going to pick easy numbers, negative 3, and then, of course, my favorite number is 0. So here we have undefined. Okay, we know that it's going to be an asymptote. Okay, right there. Uh, and then if we plug negative 2 into our second derivative, which is right here, what we'd find is negative 2. Uh, this will be... So now if we take the value of negative 3 and we put it in back into the second derivative, which is right here, okay, so we take negative 3, put it into there, um, because of this negative exponent right here, the whole thing goes to positive, okay, so it changes to positive. Uh, when we substitute x is equal to 0, that's going to be negative, okay, so remember, positive, concave up, negative, concave down, okay? So those are our intervals of increase and decrease, or sorry, our intervals of concavity. I'm on the wrong question. And in the end, you always want to put a nice statement that says um, f at x is concave up for when x is smaller than 2. f at x is concave down for when x is greater than negative 2.